Hello, my name is Matthew Leduc, and I'll be presenting this work called Corporate Culture and Organizational Fragility, which is joint with Matt Elliott and Ben Golub. Corporate culture is a very broad concept. Obviously, there's no single accepted definition for it. It's been studied in the past as a control mechanism constraining or incentivizing certain choices within an organization. Likewise, an unspoken code of communication or conventions that help limit miscoordinations. In this talk, we will focus on the role of corporate culture in helping collaborations succeed within an organization. Corporate culture is naturally endogenous in the sense that it depends on the efforts that are exerted by individuals within an organization. For example, efforts in adhering to organizational values, in communicating relevant practices or expectations, or likewise efforts to enforce norms within the organization. Now, these efforts will collectively determine what we will call the overall strength of corporate culture. In this sense, we will model corporate culture as a form of organizational public good that aids collaboration, communication, and coordination within an organization. A potential challenge is that in a large organization with many workers, each worker's contribution to the culture becomes relatively trivial. And therefore, the free rider problem may become severe. So we can ask, how can a strong corporate culture be sustained in such a large organization? What we will find is that complex organizations can indeed sustain strong corporate cultures, and that although the marginal impact of a particular worker is very small, in equilibrium, we nevertheless see positive contributions made to the corporate culture. On the other hand, this, or, this organization will be fragile in the sense that small shocks to the culture, coming, for example, from a merger or the arrival of a new CEO, could uh, potentially seriously disrupt the functioning of the organization. So we will model a large organization as a network of tasks. Let's say a lar large organization seeks to complete a complex project. We'll take as an example a software project in the stock. So this will be the main task, and it will be supported by a network of subtasks which will feature two properties, complexity and redundancy. By complexity, we mean that each task will require a certain number of different subtasks that will have to be completed in order for the task to be itself completed. And by redundancy, we will mean that uh, for each subtask, there will be potentially several sources capable of providing that subtask. You can think of it as several workers capable of providing that subtask. So to visualize, here we have an organizational tree, a task tree, with on top a main task, which is the software project. You can think of a person uh, basically being responsible for that task as a software project manager. And we see that this task depends on two complementary subtasks. One of them is provided by R&D engineers. You can think of it as the software code. And the other one is provided by marketing analysts. You can think of it as a marketing study or a feasibility study and so on and so forth. Now, likewise, these subtasks themselves depend on other subtasks. For example, the marketing task may need uh, <clears throat> excuse me, input from data scientists, which is a subtask, and another input from client service specialists, which is another subtask. Now, in this example, we have a complexity level of two, meaning that each task requires two complementary subtasks, and we have a redundancy parameter of two as well, meaning that for each subtask that there are potentially two sources that can provide it. Think of, for example, two software engineers capable of providing, each providing the code for the software. 
Now, this tree has only three layers, but you can imagine a tree that extends much deeper with many more than just three layers. Each collaboration will be successful with some probability pi, which we take as a one-dimensional summary of the effective strength of corporate culture. So we use a reduced form approach. Now, naturally, miscommunication can lead some collaborations to fail. And this is more likely when the strength of corporate culture is lower. So a task will be successfully completed, making the corresponding node operational, if for each input that type required, there is at least one successful collaboration with an operational node. So we can visualize this. Here we have the same organizational tree as before, minus the labels. So with probability one minus pi, certain edges in the tree disappear. They represent failed collaborations, failed communication, for example. Now, because of these failed collaborations, well, obviously, a number of tasks will be unable to source their required input subtasks. Here, these tasks that are not being able, not, not completed successfully are shown in red. So we can ask the question, what is the pro and as a matter of fact, you see that the software project here, the head task, is not successfully completed in this case because of a lack of required input tasks. Now we can ask the question, what is the probability that the head task, the software project in our example, be successfully completed? We can derive an expression for that. So if we call the probability that a given task is successfully completed, given that its required input tasks are completed with some probability R, well, we can express it as follows. First of all, note, that pi times r is the probability that a given collaboration results in a subtask being sourced. One minus that is the probability that a given collaboration results in a subtask not being sourced. Raising that to an exponent of n is the probability that a given subtask cannot be sourced at all. n is the redundancy or multi-sourcing parameter. One minus that is the probability that a given subtask can be sourced via some successful collaboration. And raising this to an exponent m, the complexity parameter, or the number of different input subtasks that must all be present for uh, a task to be completed, this will be here the probability that a task can be completed. Now, if we extend our tree to many, many layers, we take L, the number of layers, to be very large, then by a symmetry argument, this probability that the project is successful can be written as follows. And that gives us a fixed point equation for the variable R, which is the probability that a given task can be successfully completed. We will denote the largest fixed point of that equation by rho of pi, noting the dependency on the parameter pi, which is the strength of corporate culture or the probability that any given collaboration in our task tree is successful. What is the shape of that function rho of pi, of that probability that the complex project can be uh, successfully completed? Well, it looks like that, and as we can see, it exhibits a discontinuity such that when the strength of corporate culture is lower than a critical level, the probability that the project is completed is literally zero. It's impossible to complete the project. And past the critical level, the probability jumps to a strictly positive number and remains positive thereafter. We can formalize this naturally in a lemma. Now, I have told you the first two subparts of that lemma. If we look at subpart three of that lemma, the limit of the derivative of that curve as we approach the discontinuity from above is infinity, which means that here, the derivative of that curve grows infinitely large. This will be important. 
Now let us endogenize corporate culture. We've described the physics of the task tree. Now let's get into the economics and introduce an investment game in which K workers in the organization simultaneously choose an investment uh, X sub I at a cost C of X sub I. The corporate culture strength will be determined as a function which is essentially a weighted average of the contributions uh, or the efforts invested by each worker. These are efforts invested in maintaining the corporate culture, adhering to norms, et cetera, which are naturally costly. And the corporate culture is increasing in these efforts through this function, which is a weighted average of these efforts. Now we will denote underscore pi as the baseline level of corporate culture, which is the level of corporate culture when, a, when the workers in the organization invests nothing. We will make the assumption that the weight of any agent in a, any agent I in an organization of K workers goes to zero as the number K of workers in the organization grows large. So that each agent has a relatively trivial impact on corporate culture as the organization grows. This will capture the free rider problem as the organizations, the organization employs more workers. So the timing is as follows. Employees will choose investments in the corporate culture simultaneously. Then the strength of corporate culture will be endogenously realized. And each link in our task tree will be functional with that endogenous probability. It will be kept in the tree. The collaboration network will then be formed. And we can determine whether the complex project is successfully completed or not. Now, the expected utility of an agent has this form. It is essentially increasing in the probability rho here that this, the complex project is successfully completed. There's a heterogeneity parameter A sub I, which captures the fact that upon success of the complex project, Naturally, each employee can draw a different profit from that success or a different, uh, different level of benefits from that success, but all workers benefit from the organization being able to complete the complex project. And obviously, they must pay a cost of adhering to the norms of the organization, maintaining the corporate culture. Now, we will suppose that the baseline level of corporate culture is smaller than the critical level at which the probability that the, the complex project is successfully completed becomes positive in the sense that if agents were to invest nothing in maintaining the corporate culture, then the complex project could not be completed. Otherwise, the game is not interesting. So workers' problem will be to maximize this expected utility function. And if we study the first order condition of that problem, if we look for a positive contribution equilibrium, we have here the first order equation and this, the first order conditions in the sense that the marginal benefits must equal the marginal cost of investing in maintaining the corporate culture. Now, if we look at this first order condition, which is reproduced here, we see that the marginal benefits appear to be going to zero as the organization grows large, because the weight of any particular worker goes to zero. And therefore, his impa the impact of his investment in the corporate culture appears to go to zero, whereas the cost, the marginal cost of investing in the culture is never zero. It's strictly positive. So the only way to sustain a positive contribution equilibrium will be for this rate at which the probability is success the probability that the project is successfully completed the rate with respect to the corporate culture strength uh, to grow arbitrarily large in equilibrium to counter this uh, decreasing influence that each worker has in the growing organization. That's the only way to sustain a positive contribution equilibrium. So this immediately tells us 
that the equilibrium will, the equilibrium corporate culture strength will be located very close to the critical point. Whereas we remember that derivative of rho with respect to pi was growing arbitrarily large. That is the only way to maintain a positive contribution equilibrium. Now, obviously, this can be formalized into uh, a proposition. First of all, I will give you a definition of fragility. We will call an equilibrium profile epsilon fragile if the probability that the complex project is successfully completed becomes zero following any shock to the baseline corporate culture uh, strength that is greater than epsilon. Now, the following proposition as, first of all, an existence result, you can show that there always exists a no contribution equilibrium where uh, agents invest zero in maintaining the corporate culture. Naturally, this will not be a productive equilibrium. And we can also show that there exists a positive contribution equilibrium in which all agents invest a positive amount in maintaining the corporate culture. On the other hand, the second part is a characterization result. We can show that this equilibrium will be epsilon fragile in the sense that a small shock to corporate culture will basically push the equilibrium off the precipice. The equilibrium will be located here, but following a small shock to the baseline corporate culture, the probability of completing the complex project uh, successfully will drop to zero. So we have a notion of equilibrium fragility. Now, what are these shocks? Um, we can think of them as exogenous shocks to corporate culture, but we can think of interesting ways to microfound them. Let us look at the effect of leadership on corporate culture. Let's suppose that at a new stage zero of the game, each firm, J, chooses a corporate culture from a set, a finite set of corporate cultures. Here, the corporate culture, theta, sub j is the corporate culture chosen by a firm j. This can be a high dimensional vector because corporate culture is a complex object that can depend on many different dimensions. For example, a communication protocol, um, a safe uh, adherence to safety protocols. There can be many dimensions to a corporate culture. On the other hand, we can conveniently map this high dimensional vector to a probability, a one-dimensional number, and this basically will be done through this function here, which basically creates this baseline corporate culture. So a firm, J, the, the leadership of the firm, will choose a corporate culture so as to maximize this baseline corporate culture. It will choose a corporate culture that is optimal for that firm. There's not a single corporate culture that is optimal for all firms. Each firm can choose its own optimal corporate culture. The leadership of the firm sets that. This creates a baseline corporate culture. And then the employees within the organization will play the game that I defined previously in the sense they will, that they will exert efforts to maintain that, that corporate culture and accordingly increase the strength of the corporate culture. Now, let's look at an applications of a shock to corporate culture caused by merger. Let's suppose two firms merge and must select a common corporate culture because they have the same leadership, even though their operations, their productive operations might remain separated. Then unless there existed a corporate culture choice that was identical, identically optimal for both firms prior to the merger, then at least one of the two firms will operate with a corporate culture that is a worse fit for it. Which means that either the baseline corporate culture of firm J or that of firm um, J prime will decrease or perhaps even both. This will create a shock to the baseline corporate culture, which is precisely what we had talked about, although we 
assume that the shock was exogenous in the previous uh, exposition. But now this is a micro foundation, which can basically explain how such a shock could occur. Now, obviously, if the equilibrium is fragile and the baseline corporate culture decreases, this can tip the equilibrium off the precipice and basically prevent at least temporarily an organization to function properly following a merger. Another uh, application of this framework would be the arrival of a new CEO. We know that uh, firm share prices, for example, can react very strongly to news about a CEO's health and that successful firms often seem to promote from within the firm to leadership position. A key example of that is obviously that of Apple in 2011. Now, suppose that the set of corporate culture choices can be specific to the leadership of the firm. Then after a change in leadership, the initial optimal choice of corporate culture may no longer be feasible, which can lower the baseline uh, corporate culture strength, there, thereby causing a shock that can tip the equilibrium off the precipice and prevent, at least temporarily, an, organi an organization from functioning. Now, very uh, interestingly, internal candidates are more likely to have access to the same set of possible corporate cultures and therefore make a similar optimal choice, which can reduce the, the, the possibility of uh, disruptions following a CEO change, for example. Now, to conclude, um, corporate culture can be viewed as a form of firm-specific social capital that aids collaboration and communication. It depends on costly adherence by employees. It is obviously crucial for completing complex tasks. And the ability to complete complex tasks can be very sensitive to it, as we saw. Now, negative shocks to corporate culture caused by the micro-founded mechanisms that I just described can seriously disrupt a firm's ability to complete complex projects, which is congruent with evidence and anecdotal observations. This is all the time that I have. I hope this was interesting. Thank you very much.